A lot of heaters that don't gather around it, okay? <laughs> it's a dehumidifier. If there's any damp in here, it is guaranteed to pull all the damp out so as we don't get it on the floor. So the radiators are here and here. Don't go near the back box, okay? And don't switch it off. Please don't switch it off. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 9. It says, uh, two are better than one. Are you with me? Two are better than one because, now let, first of all, it says they have a good reward for their labor. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. If they fall, then one will lift up his fellow. So if, one, if something happens and one goes down, well, there's, at least there's somebody there to help you back up. And then if the other one falls, well, somebody can help up. But woe to him that is alone. When he falleth, he has no other to help him up. And again, then if two lie together, they have heat. But how can, how can one uh, be warm on his own? Look at somebody say, switch the electric blanket on. But listen to this one. Listen to this. But if one prevail against him, in other words, if he's overcome, have you ever been overcome? Has the enemy ever knocked you for sex? Have you ever ended up in hospital? Have you ever ended up broke? Has the enemy actually got one up on you? Here's what he says. If one prevail against him, listen to this, two shall withstand him. Did you get a hold of that? Two shall withstand him. And then, of course, a threefold cord is not easy broken. But let me tell you something. Let, let me say that again. He says, two shall withstand him. So there's situations that I cannot, cannot, cannot handle on my own. There's some things that's too big for me. There's some things that's too overwhelming for me. There's some things I'm not qualified to handle. There's some things above my pay grade. There's some things I just don't have the knowledge of it. But the Bible tells me if there's two of us, if I can find somebody else who will stand with me and agree with me, then I can make it through. Look at somebody say, just hold my hand and we'll make it through together. <laughs> he said this, if one prevail against him, two then, two will be able to withstand him. I'd like you to think about that one scripture. We're going to talk on that one there. Two will be able to withstand. Whatever you're handling right now, you're probably, you're probably a genius. You're probably the best there is. But there's things out there that's bigger than you. There's things out there out of your control. And there's things that no matter how smart you are, you cannot do it alone. It's the way God set it up. So you need somebody. I need you. And you need me. Look at the person beside you and say, I believe I need you. I need you because the two of us together can make it. Now, if three full cord and a multitude of us come together, man, we'll be hard to knock down. But he says two of them, just two of them, two of them, two of them will be able to withstand whatever is coming against us. I believe we've entered a season in, in, the, in the move of God that most of the church is unprepared for. For example, the enemy of our soul right now, he, he knows the scriptures better than we do. He knows it. He knows what's coming. It's already told him what's ahead. He knows his end. He knows even if he gets a seven-year tribulation period, he understands his time is short. So what we have is an enemy, a devil, who is very much afraid because he knows he's got to do whatever he can now to do the best job, but he knows it won't work. He knows. So what he wants to do is try to pull down as many before his end comes, but he knows his end will come. So we got a devil that's fearful. And because he's fearful, he is attacking like never before. And you may right now be the focus of his attention. He's an angry devil. And he's, he's pressing, pushing, he's conniving, he's doing all types of stuff. And right now you might be the focus of his attention. I hope you're not, but you might be. And you might be doing everything to withstand, but Jesus said, two of you, two of you can withstand them. Two of you can overcome them. You can't do it on your own now. If it's big enough and bad enough and ugly enough, you cannot do it on your own, but two can withstand them. In other words, if we join forces, if we join forces, then we will be able to take ground. The old proverbial statement says that there's safety in numbers. I like to put it this way. The best, one of the best ways to win is to phone a friend. Look at somebody say, phone a friend. I know it's hard if it came show, but I couldn't remember what, what it was out of. But phone a friend. So you need on your, you need on your phone 
people who you can phone in a time of need, a time of trouble, or a time of victory, that you can hit that button and, and tell them, will you hear what happened to me? And they won't get jealous. They won't become sarcastic. They won't, they won't, they won't even ask you how, what, and when. They'll just say, wow, it couldn't happen to a nicer person than you. You need somebody on your phone that in a crisis that you can hit that, and they won't turn around and say, well, your sin's caught up with you. That they, they'll not turn around and say, well, I told you so. I might have known. It couldn't happen to a better person than you. No, you, if that's the way they talk to you, delete them off the phone. Look at somebody say, your number's going in the morning. <laughs> <coughs> delete them off the phone. You do not need them there. But everybody needs a section on their phone when they've got a number they can hit. And even if they can't get room to say it, they can send a text and say, please help. And you know the person at that other end is for you. They may not even get, they might not be in a place to text you back, but at least you know they've got my number, they're now doing something about it, they'll not let me down. Everybody needs a friend. Let me tell you, listen, let's look at this for a moment or two. Jesus, and it says in two passages of Scripture, in John chapter 1 and verse 43, the Bible says that the day following, Jesus went, uh, would go forth into Galilee. And listen to this, and he findeth Philip, and he said unto him, follow me. So Jesus went out of his way one day from whatever he was doing to a certain district. Went, just I don't know if he got a bus there or how he got there. He went to a certain district. He went looking for somebody. He got there and he found Philip. And he walked up to Philip and just said, Philip, follow me. I don't think Philip ever knew who he was. But this is what Jesus was doing. Let me go to Mark chapter 1. And I'm going to pull this together for you. Mark chapter 1 and verse 16. And now Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee. He's in a different district now. He's in a different district. He walked by the Sea of Galilee. And he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother. They were casting nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus came up unto them. And he says, come ye after me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and they followed him. Now he went, then, then he was gone a little further thence. He went to another area. He went to another area a little bit further. And he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the ship mending their nets. And straightway he called them and he left there. They left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. Jesus chose whom he wanted to have on his team with him. And of all the multitudes of people, he just didn't turn around and say, well, everybody, come on, come on, come on. Follow me, we're all going down this. No, 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 no. He went over here looking for somebody. He went, he left and went down another way specifically looking for somebody else. He walked up to people, specifically chose them who he wanted to be on his team. It takes time. It takes time to find those who God has assigned to you to help you in your quest of life. They're called relationships. You build friendships and friendships comes into relationships. Everybody can be your friend, but not everybody can have a relationship with you. And Jesus did it this way. He met with everybody, but he went in particular looking for people. He walked to one district and said, I want you, you, and you. Come with me. And he walked over. He went somewhere else and said, come on ahead with me. I want you to be a part of the team. It's actually the first thing the Lord Jesus did before he went and started his real ministry. He went and chose a team. Team. He went and chose the people that he would have run with them. In other words, he picked his partners. He knew he couldn't have everybody with him because not everybody would be for him. Look at somebody say, not everybody's for you. You need to understand they don't all love you. They're not all by your presence. They're not all applaud you. They're not all say, well done when you get it. They may say it with their mouth, but it won't come out of their heart. But Jesus began to put together, he put together a team of people who he would then train to impact the world. He and them would impact the world together. He's the son of God, almighty God. He could have done it on his own, but he said, here's the way it's done. I'm not going to do it on my own. I need a people around me that I will be in relations with. I need to find those people. Look at somebody say, I need to find those people too. I really believe there's people that God has assigned to you. Some of them are assigned for a season. And a season says so they're assigned to a season, they come into your life, they, they add to you, they blossom, and then they disappear. 
And you don't have to chase after him with words of appreciation. He just every now and then said, remember him? I was a nothing until I met him. Look at me now. But you don't have to go back there. These are people that God has signs into your life. Some of them's for seasons. Some of them's for a lifetime. But you understand when God puts them in there, it's to help you. And sometimes it's for you to help them. Works two ways. I have traveled this nation specifically in the last seven years connecting with people. Making connections with those people, I needed them in my life. I need, people, I, I need as much help as everybody else. It's just principles. I'm human. So there's people that God has assigned to help me. And there's other people then I was assigned to help them. And I've traveled the length and breadth of this nation and other nations, but specifically this nation, to look for the help, look for the people who's been assigned with me in, the, in this thing that God has called me to do. They're called divine connections. Divine connections comes through divine appointments. In other words, you turn up at the right place at the right time that God has ordained and suddenly there's a person you shake hands with and you're almost friends for a lifetime. And you know you can rely on them, you can talk to them, you know they, but it's because you phone them seven times a week it doesn't mean you're abusing. No, they'll never feel that way. They'll always say, I'm there for you. In a time of crisis, you can phone them in the middle of the night and they're there for you because they've been assigned to you. Some of them, you're assigned to them. Some of them, they're assigned to you, but they're divine appointments and they're linked to your purpose. For you to fulfill their need, they're linked to your purpose. You need to find out who they are. We call it, in in this modern day society, we call it networking or you can call it partnerships. You can call it relationships. But in this generation we live in for all those 30-somethings, it's called networking. We needed to be networked with other people. We need to be linked with the right people. And let me tell you something. You can only partner, you can only network with people who think the same as you, who dream the same as you, who believe the same as you, and who are seeing the same things as you. You can't do it any other way because if they're running a different game, if they're running a different thing, they'll, they will never add to you. They will never help you through. They'll, they'll always be taken away from you instead of adding to you. And, and you've got to understand this, not, not everybody will be for you. There's some of them is too competitive. And when you get a little bit further and they actually help you to get further, become jealous then. And there's really no room for strife. There's no room for jealousy. And there's really no competition in the body of Christ either. We're meant to celebrate each other's victories. And when somebody overcomes the enemy, we were meant to celebrate that together. And if one's down, we're meant to be there helping them all up together. It's the body of Christ. It's the way we do it. But we need to find people we can depend on. If you can find just one person that you can depend on, it will make a difference because two can withstand that enemy. Let me read you another passage of Scripture out of Luke chapter 5 and verse 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them, for they were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which Simon's, which was Simon's, and he prayed him and said, Would you thrust out a little from the land? Uh, and then he sat down and he taught the people out of the boat. And then uh, uh, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Now go a little further out into the deeper waters, and then let down your net for a, for a, a haul of fish, for a draught. And Simon answered and said, and said Master, now wait a minute. We have, we've, we've, we've done this all night. We've, we've toiled, we've labored all night, and let me tell you, we have caught nothing. Nevertheless, nevertheless, he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. You're saying you're my friend. I will, I will do it. We'll do it. Okay, we'll just do it. We'll let, let down. He did that half heartedly. I will do it. And when he had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes so that their, ver- their nets almost broke. And listen to this. And they beckoned unto their partners. They beckoned unto their partners, which were in other ships, that they should come and help them. And they began and they filled the ships so that they all began to sink. And oh, it was a huge, huge harvest. And when Simon saw it, he fell down uh, at Jesus' feet and he said, Depart from me because I am a, a," the King James has said, a sinful man, but most other translations says a disobedient man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the size of the catch of fish that was taken. And so was also uh, James and John, the son of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And they said unto Simon, he, Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, now from henceforth I will teach you how to catch men. 
Now, let me tell you something. What is coming for you and I? This is a year of increase. This is a year of completion. What is coming is too big for one person's net. It's too big for one person's net. So we have got to learn how to pull together. Because when that harvest comes, you've, you've got to hit that phone and say, what did I tell you? Say, what do you hear about the blessing? And you've got to learn how to share your blessing. You've got to learn how to tell about the blessing. At the same time, you'll find out, because listen to this, notice, notice just, just before what happened, just before the harvest came. Just before the harvest came in Simon Peter's life, it was the worst night of his life. It was the worst night. They'd been out all night, They'd done everything they knew how to do, and they caught zilch. They caught nothing. They're going to get no pay. They've worked hard, and they've shown nothing for it. And here it is, the, 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 the night before the greatest victory happened to be the worst night of them all. Have you ever thought to yourself, look at all this. Look at the years. Look at the tears. Look at the energy. I've, I've tried everything. I've done every which way. I've tried every new idea. I've tried every program. I've read the book. I've done what that boy up the front told me. <laughs> And here we are, and after all this time, I'm no better off. I don't seem to have any other victories. Listen to this. I've been let down. I've been put down. I've been turned down till I'm run down. Now, get that down on the, on the Facebook. You get that? I'll tell you it again. I've been let down. I've been put down, turned down until I'm run down. Did you ever feel like out there? You look, I say, what is all this? I'm, just, I'm, I'm razzled. I'm just, I'm just tired now. I've done everything I knew how to do. Here's Peter. He said, listen, Master. He said, I'm, I'm wore out. I've been out there all night, and you're telling me to go again? I've, I, I, I've no energy to do it. But he said, I, 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 I'll do it. The night before the greatest victory was the worst night that he had ever had in his existence. The greatest failures of your life usually precedes your greatest successes. And it's my job to prepare you for both. Because there's an enemy, and he will get you to the place where the biggest failures will hit. And my job is to help you through the failures. And my job is not just to help you through the failures, but my job is to help you through the successes. And I'd rather celebrate the successes with you than sit and hold your hand through the crisis, but I'm prepared to do both. And you have to be prepared for both. Because the people that you run with will have as many crises as they will have victories. And you need to learn how to celebrate their victories and at the same time learn how to nurse them through the crisis. It's the way it is. We've got to train each other. You know, they, they tell me, the history books now record that after Argentina uh, fought uh, with Britain way down on the, on the coast and the, the Falklands, way down there, when the war was over, when it was settled, and all the soldiers and all them people returned back home, the prisoners were released to turn back home. You know something? They had used, the Argentinian government had used all the money to buy tanks, to buy warfare, to buy planes, to keep them all on the move. And, and they used all the resources just to have that Falklands War, which they were defeated. All came home humiliated, defeated, and they came here, come home broke because the country had nothing left. And it was right in that time in their darkest hour, in Argentina's darkest hour, when they were literally on their knees, God visited them, the Spirit of God visited them, and there was what now called the Argentinian revival when God broke loose. There was a, a night of failure, a night of darkness, the most unsuccessful season in that nation's life, but it preceded, it went just before the greatest victories of their life in the spiritual realm whenever, whenever they had major, major breakthroughs. You don't know how close you are to just breaking through. You don't know. Usually when the enemy fights hardest, he's fighting the worst. This is the worst. I've never felt as bad. I've never been as broke. It's just before your major breakthroughs coming. He's doing everything to get you to break down and back down so as you'll go no further. This is why you need somebody. Look at somebody say, that's why I'm here. Look at somebody say, you need me. Yes, Superman and Superwoman there. This is why you need me, because the person sitting beside you could be going through the darkest night in their life. They're making decisions and they don't know how to make them. This is too big for them. It's overwhelming for them. And they need somebody. They don't need criticism. They don't need judgment. They don't even need a word of ridicule. They just need you. They need tender living care. They need you. Let me tell you something. You know it and I know it as believers. Not everybody has our welfare at their hearts. Not, not everybody cares about our families the way that, the way that, that mom and dad did. Not, not everybody is moved 
by, by our personal struggles. You can tell them and they don't even bat an eyelid. But let me tell you something. This is why we need partners. This is why we need prayer partners. Because when that enemy attacks and you know it's bigger than you and you're struggling and there's no harm in struggling. It's not a sin to struggle. But let me tell you something. God says, I've made it this way that you'll never fight alone. I'll always have somebody in your arena that can pick up that piece for you. That could be you this morning, that God has put you in somebody's life to help them through their time of troubles. We've got to learn how to do both. We've got to learn how to have people through their troubles, and we've got to help them and celebrate with them in the midst of the victories. Absolutely. See, if you can find somebody like that, you don't have to impress them. You don't have to turn up in a suit. You don't even have to talk. You just just be sitting there. You know, you're, they totally understand you. They, they, they're for you. They're not against you. You don't have to pretend to be something that you're not. You just get on with because they'll love you. You don't have to make excuses because this didn't work. No, no, they're for you. Look at somebody say, I'm for you. I'm for you. And, 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 and they understand because they know you. They understand where you're coming from and what, what you mean. And even if they didn't really know you, God has put them on your heart. You're like an assignment to them to help you through this next phase of life. God assigns people to you. I told you this before in an illustration, but they have these huge, this is the tallest trees in the world. I believe they're the widest trees in the world, and, and they're, they're called redwoods, and it's in uh, forests of California, and one area in particular. They say the trees are so massive that some of them have caught a tunnel out of them. You can actually drive a car right through them. I'd love to see that sometime. That sounds like something else. But they, they say these trees are the tallest trees, yet with all, their root system only goes down into the ground about three feet. And the greatest query was, there, how come a huge tree like that with only a three-foot root system, how can that thing stay in the ground when the storms come? And so centuries ago, they dug deep to find out how that thing stayed, and they realized that the roots didn't go down, but the roots went out. And those trees put their roots outside. They only went down three foot and then went out this way. And then when they went out each way, they lapped their roots round the next tree's roots. And they lapped the roots. So all the trees in the forest were networked. They were linked together. So they said some of them trees, when the rangers and the foresters went down, some of them trees had been hit with lightning and were actually dead, but they were still standing because the roots of the next tree were holding them so tight that they couldn't fall. Are you getting a hold of this? And so we definitely need our roots down. We need that root down with a, like the great palm tree. The reason it can bend right over and it doesn't break, it doesn't snap. You ever see them in the hurricane? They're bent right over like this. They're no flexible than anything else, you know, but they're bent right over, but it's the root system that holds it because the root system will go down a mile deep if necessary and it's down there looking for stones and rocks. It'll bypass. The root goes down, looks for small stones, can't find it. Looks, it's looking for a rock. And when it finds a big rock, the root system will lop itself round a rock, a rock. So when the winds come, this is so far anchored down here, it'll blow this way, but the storm's over, pops straight up again. The giant redwood went the other way. Instead of standing solo in the midst of the storm, it locked roots with everybody else so that whenever one was hit, all the other roots would help it. God has made the body of Christ such as this that there's some storms in life that are too big for you. There's some devils that's too ugly. There's some things we just don't have knowledge of. I wish we did, but we don't. So God locks, gets us to lock our roots together. So we need each other. And there's those that's in around us. And sometimes we look at them and because of all types of things, we discard them. But let me tell you, there's, there's people and God puts an assignment in their life to be there for you. I travel the length and breadth of this, this island. The reason many people watch this on YouTube right now is because I've linked with them. I've, I've visited them. Some of them invited me when there's six people going, but I never asked them, how many people have you in your fellowship? When they said, when you come, and I got before and I'd always say, Lord, will I go? And if the Lord said, go, I'd go. Sometimes you'd turn up and the six people are, who cares? You know what I'm looking for? I'm looking for those people who God has assigned to me, and I'm looking for those that I'm assigned to to help them through their crisis. I remember when I was in Enniskillen and pastor and I knew not and knew nobody. No, you're that, not, Enniskillen's only 90 minutes up the road now. It's nothing. But in them days, it was, it was a, a difficult journey to go on. The roads were bad. They were twisty. And 
I'm not saying anything about Fermana. But let me tell you something. It was just a long way to go to pastor a church. You drive up in the morning and then you drive back home and then you drive back at night again and you drive back home and you drive several times during the week to prayer meetings, Bible studies and to visit the sick. It was a long, long journey. Long journey. And let me tell you some one of them days in the midst of it, I was tired. I was weary. I remember being in my office when nobody's around. And I tell you something, I, I, I said, God, I need help. I don't know how to do this. I, 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 he was teaching me how to pastor a people. And let me tell you, in the midst of it, I made a vow one day. This is over 35, 33 years ago, and I've never forgot the vow that I made. If I haven't forgotten, I guarantee God hasn't forgotten. But I remember in, a, in the little office, now, I, I, as big as a shoebox, nothing in there but a chair and a desk and, and, and one single light bulb hanging. And I remember making a vow unto the Lord. I said, God, have you helped me? If you help me get this together, if you help me pastor these people, I said, one day when I'm strong enough, I'll look across this island and I'll find them churches and them fellowships and them prayer groups and house meetings that have no leaders and I'll network with them and I'll reach them and I'll help as many. I don't need to speak in their churches. I don't need to talk in their house groups. I don't even need them to send me money. I just need to help them get through what I'm getting through right now. And God honored that. And God honored that. This year there's been two new, new places has opened to me. And I didn't, go, didn't say, well, I'm many of you going to turn up there? Can you, can you guarantee me a hundred people? Never did. I got to go. I said, I'll go anywhere at least once. But I'll go there because there's people that's assigned to me. And there's people that I'm assigned to that I've got to help. And they're there. I'm maybe only there for a season, but I've got to do it because my roots go out. And I'm going to lap my roots around other people to help them. Jesus said to Simon Peter that night, he says, cast your nets out, son. He said, what's out there is unbelievable. It's a catch that you've never had in your life, and it's so close to you. Before the next six hours is over, it'll be in your boat. It'll be yours. And Simon said, I right. <laughs> right. He said, I have done, you know, I was out there last night. And you're telling me in the same waters, there's all that harvest that I was out and caught nothing? She said, that's right. Just trust me. Trust me. I'm assigned to you. I'm here to help you. Just do it one more time. One more time. He went out and this time dropped the nets. They couldn't even pull the, pull the fish in. They saw the fish jumping all over the place. And let me tell you something. But he called his partners. He called his partners. They already had partners out there. And said, we got a harvest that we can't handle all on our own. He had trouble 12 hours ago that he couldn't handle on his own. Now he's got a harvest that he couldn't handle on his own. I'd rather have the harvest that I couldn't handle on my own than the thing. But at least God said, I don't want it to go to waste, son. He said, there's enough here for everybody. So you need before the trials, the darkness ever comes, have those people in around you that you can share your dreams, your happinesses, and they can help you in your hour of trouble. Are you with me? You're, you're a part of the body of Christ. You're networked. God placed you here. I, I don't think you ever met me by accident. Your granny may have paid you money to come here. But let me tell you something. I don't think you came back here by accident. And I don't think you came here because of my Davener chic and charming personality. I think you're here because... God brought you here. There's a thousand other churches in Ireland. You, you probably passed at least six churches to get here this morning. Any of them would, would have done you. In fact, some of them would have maybe did, did you good. <laughs> but you passed them all because I believe there's what you call a divine appointment in your life. And God brought you in and around our arena for a season. I believe you're here by divine, uh, by divine appointment for a divine reason because of the purpose that's on the inside of you. Either that purpose networks to be a part of what we're doing, or else whatever we have is a part of what you're doing to assist you in whatever. Priscilla, who came from, from south, from all that way, from Dunleary, hey, she couldn't be a part of this vision because she lives a long way away. She, she couldn't be a part of this vision. But evidently, we were a part of her vision. And I remember the day talking to her in Dunleary and she, she held my hand and she held Laura's hand and she said, she said, I don't want to call you Joe and I don't want to call you Laura. I said, well, that's the name I have. What are you going to call me? She said, I want to call you a pastor. I said, right. She said, I want you to be my pastor. I said, you live in the other side of Dublin and I live up here in 49. She said, I know. She says, but I need your covering. 
I need your prayers. I need what you have over my life. Will you do it? And I remember that day shaking hands or my lover hugging her. I said, we will. We'll be your cover. We'll be even the, your Zambia or whatever. We'll still, we'll still be your pastor. She, she, she writes this all the time, notifies us, uh, updates us where she's going. We got other pastors under us in, other, in the UK, for instance, and every Monday they call me and update me what's going on in their church. I'm not over there. I'm too far away from me to go every Sunday to there. I go maybe twice a year over to see what's going on. But they inform me of all that's going on. Most they want me to share in the victories, and I'm there at times to share in their trials. It works both ways. But God has brought you here to network you. God is here for to put your root system in. The Bible says, They that are planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of God. Planted. Planted, you take a pot and you take a plant and you plant it. It simply means you take good care of its roots. You put it down, you bed it, and you get it all fitted, and you gotta get a pot that's the right size for the thing for its roots. God wants your root system to be locked into something. There's nothing worse than church hoppers and they go, and I know everybody everybody has a right and a freedom to pick where you want to go. And I know there's even times I'll say to you, hey, go somewhere else and have a look and do this here. I understand that. But your root system needs to be locked somewhere because there's some trials, there's some tribulations that's too big for you on your own. There's some victories it's too big for you to share. You're going to have somebody to giggle with. You've got to have somebody to talk, tell and say, we do you hear what's just happened to me? If you've never had one of them, then you've never had a victory. You, you need one of them victories so on the inside of you say, this is too big for me. I've got to tell somebody. I've got to tell somebody. So this is why you've got to have somebody you can phone. And somebody, if they don't turn up for church for three weeks, that they're not going to phone you and say, you have a spirit of suicide and a spirit of, spirit of back, backsliding and some spirit of grief. And you, you don't need that. You just need somebody that understands you need somebody that understands what you're going through. We're not perfect. And there's a bad boy called a devil out there who knows how to handle you roughly. And so I need you. Look at somebody say, I need you. You say, well, I got a wife. I got one. I got one too. But let me tell you something. We have other people. We have other people. And there's times some things come against Laura and I that's too big for us. I'm just Joe. You, you forget about the badge. I'm just Joe. I'm just, 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 just Laura. And there's some things in life that overwhelms us. That's life. But let me tell you something. We have other people. And when life becomes overwhelming, there's something, hey, we won't bother people with their stuff. But when there's some things that's too big for us, I got people on my phone. And I'll phone and they'll not turn. They, usually the one fellow says, what do you want? <laughs> But I know he says it, he says it, he's a fellow, but he says it like a mother. You know, you can go to him, he just he has such a heart for you, and he says, what do you want? I say, well, we got a crisis going here. He say, okay, get the prayer teams going right now. And he never, never put you down, never said, hey, I'll age it. <laughs> never turns around, condemns, doesn't do it. Sometimes he just say, do you want to talk? You say, okay, and he won't say a word. he just let you ramble on, talk. You get it off your chest. Whatever said is in confidence. When he hangs up the phone, he says, I'll pray for it over here, I'll do it. And then you, you phone him a couple of days later and say, well, it's not any better or it is better, but you, you, that. see when it's over? It's over. Never spoke about again. As a confidant, that's a friend. You see, you need one of them and you also need to be one of them to somebody else. Somebody out there needs you, desperately needs you. Sometimes it's your closest family, although sometimes your family is the hardest to deal with. Sometimes you've got to hand them over to somebody else and let God deal with them. But you've got to find one of them. I pray you find one in the assembly, but be careful. Be careful who you tell, but find one. There's somebody out there is assigned to you you know what I say they're assigned to you? Sometimes you can find them in their books. There's books that I read, uh, I, I knew I was going down certain directions, and there's certain books that I read by certain authors, and they spoke into my life. I read it. I read the book, and I said, oh, wow, why didn't I know it? Look at this! And those books changed me. Those books give me different, different uh, 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 dimensions in my life. They caused me to think different. 
I, if it wasn't for those people in my life back then, I never met them personally. But I read their books. And I met them through their books. And what they said changed me. There's sometimes it's on a CD, a DVD. There's some people out there that God has assigned you. Now, and the truth of it is, the people that helped me back there in my early stage, especially when I was doing leadership, and there's the books I read, there's, there's leadership uh, things I studied until. I, I, I don't even bother with them anymore. They were there for a season. I needed that to help me over that phase. I, I don't bother. If I ever read them now, it would be like going back to crash. You know, at the end, you could recite them over, over and over. But I needed them back then. There's people that you need right now. And then there's people you're going to need later on. And there's people who need you. And they don't need you just because of your money or your good looks or your charms. They need you because you've got the God part in you that God has put an assignment on you. You're assigned to somebody and somebody's assigned to you. We've got to find them. We've got to find them. This morning in this business, I believe when God brings us together as a church, as a fellowship, He does it for a reason. I believe he does it because there's people in there at that time that you need and they need you. So I want you to do, we're going to close here, and I want you to just to, just to, uh, uh, take a look around you. I don't look at the person sitting beside you because you probably know them and they know you. So I just, just take a good look around you at somebody else. Have a look at least two or three different faces. Now you better smile. You, better, you always look better when you're smiling. That's it. That was a like, I know you look bad in the dark sometimes. I understand that. But look, just, just look. Just look away beyond you. Now look at the back. If you want to stand up and look, it's fine. But just take a look at somebody that you didn't come in with. Uh, just, uh, even if you don't know their name, it's fine. It's fine with me. Just take a look. Have you looked at at least two people? I want you to take those two people. I want you to put them on your heart this week. This week. Right? You don't need to know what there is going on. God knows, God knows what's going on. They could be on the point of the greatest victory, but going through the greatest trial. Or they could be going through the greatest victory that they haven't told you. But God wants you to interlock with them and they need your prayers. So here's what I want you to do, at least two people. I want you to look at two people and I'm not going to ask you to pray for them right now, but I want you to take them, take them on your heart this week. And every time you think about them this week, if you don't know their name, make a name up, just call them Trevor. <laughs> Even if it's her, call her Jimmy. Call her what you want. Put a name to it. And then just, say, just think about Trevor and Jimmy. <laughs> God, there's Jimmy again. I, God, God bless Jimmy this morning. All oh, let him get strong. I, I pray that that works out for Jimmy. So just, I want this week, this week, if you'll do it, if you'll do it, I'll tell you, God will get behind it. And it'll teach you how to partner. It'll teach you how to perp, partner with people. I've got, I've got some people who call me and, and they'll never call me again. I've got, I get text messages from people. I get that one time and I never get it again. And I got other people that's, that's consistently in, in my prayer life. I, I told you before, I got two prayer lists. I got, I got two prayer lists. One's got to do with leadership, and the other's got to do with just folks that I know. And, and, I, and I start off in, with, with, with the two of them. Sometimes I pray this list, sometimes I pray this list. Sometimes I pray the two of the list. But I have my prayer life worked out, so that I cover people. Now, I need to tell you this morning, if you look at two people in that room and just, just picture them in your mind, the Spirit of God will bring them to you morning, noon, and night. And no matter, if He brings them seven times before you, just call their name seven times. Say, God bless that person right now, whatever they're doing. And as you do it, it actually becomes very prophetic because you'll start saying, God, pray for them. And the thought, maybe they're sneezing. God, God bless them, though that cold doesn't get a hold of them. You never even knew it was cold enough, but God did. Could let that money come. I pray that them people that's talking about them will be silent. Gee, you didn't even know, but God knows he's praying through you. Becomes an adventure. This week, I want you to partner in the harvest. I want you, because if you'll do it, you'll be praying for somebody's successes. And if you'll do it, you're praying for somebody's struggles. God has a way, when you start to spiritually connect like that, God has a way of doing it physically. The next thing you know, somebody will come up to you and say, hey, will you tell you what happened to me last week? And then you'll smile to yourself and say, I was praying for that. I was praying for that. And suddenly you're into their harvest. There's some people out there who are struggling. January's, January, February is a bad month. People overspend at Christmas and they struggle. And sometimes they need your prayer. Sometimes they need your help. They need help. But if, you'll be, if you stay tuned to the Holy Spirit, He'll tell you where to meet needs. He'll tell you how to meet needs. 
So that you won't have to actually go and ask somebody to just be in your system. And as soon as a need comes, you'll say, i got to do that. i got to do it. And it's, it charges up a whole excitement. It puts you in a spiritual realm. It gets you out of the natural into a spiritual realm. This is how it's done. So look one more time at them two people. Just glance one more time at two people. Put them on your heart. And say, then, then for the rest of this week, say, I'm going to pray with them. But I'm going to pray them into success. I'm going to pray their harvest. And I'm going, to do it. I'm going to pray harder for those two people this week than I pray for myself. Are you with me? You going to do it? Are you sure? All right. Father, this morning, I thank you that we can be partners in their harvest. We will help them in their struggles, but for sure we'll help them in their successes. We are believing for the best. There's no weapon formed against them. People will prosper. That you'll bless them in the city, that you'll bless them in their field. I pray that the right partner in life will come along for them. I pray that they'll find that devoner, chic, handsome individual. I pray they'll find that one that will sweep them off their feet. I pray this week. I pray that money will come, that they'll not struggle, that their bills will be met. I, I pray that something will come to the door this week will bring a smile to their face. I pray they'll get an email, a text message, or a letter from afar that they weren't even expecting, like a little blessing just popping up in their life. I pray that harvest into them. We drive back the forces of darkness from off them. That is, that is tormenting them. It's causing them sleepless nights. We will not allow that sickness, plague, or disease to come in. We're praying for that person right now. We're part with them. Our roots are reaching out and locking in with them. We are, we're going to be stronger because we're locked in with somebody else in prayer. We're going to do mighty things because we go, we're not on our own anymore. We're going to find a way through. I thank you this morning, Father, for touching us, making us well, making us whole. This is our day. This is our time in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at somebody say, it's going to get better. Amen. Amen. All right. Come back 6.30 tonight. We'll crank it up again. Something even more exciting. All right, 6.30 tonight. God bless you.